All right, we're gonna go ahead and call open session to order. If you'll join me in stating the Pledge of Allegiance. All right, up first tonight are our recognitions. We begin tonight's recognition with two district teachers who are now finalists for the Presidential Award for Excellence in mathematics and science teaching. Jennifer Hancock and Justin Wilmus have been selected as finalists for the 2021 award, which is the highest recognition that a K-12 mathematics or science teacher can receive for outstanding teaching in the United States. Jennifer teaches seventh grade mathematics at South Middle School, and Justin teaches advanced algebra, geometry, essentials of math at Holt High School. The awards are given to mathematics and science teachers from each of the 50 states and four U.S. jurisdictions. It recognizes those teachers who develop and implement a high-quality instructional program that enhances student learning. As state-level finalists, Jennifer and Justin are now candidates for the Presidential Award, and the White House will announce those winners next year. Those selected for this presidential honor will receive a $10,000 award from the National Science Foundation and an all expenses paid trip to Washington DC for an award ceremony, educational events and visits with members of Congress and the administration. Justin is unable to join us this evening, but Jennifer is here. So, so we're pleased to recognize them both for this honor. Ladies and gentlemen, congratulations to both Mr. Justin Wilmus and Ms. Jennifer Hancock. Jennifer, congratulations to both you and Justin as well. I know you have a couple of folks in the audience who want to say anything to anyone. Thanks for all the support. I appreciate it. We're very proud of you. You're continuing a tradition here in the WSD, so we are very, very proud of what you're doing, um, not only for kids, but in working with your colleagues as well. So congratulations. To conclude our recognition of our partners who played a role in the March 20th vaccination event held right here at Holt High School, tonight we would like to thank the Wentzville Fire Protection District and the Wentzville Chick-fil-A. Working alongside the WSD, all of the, found, all of the volunteers who helped vaccinate more than 900 school staff members from across the county, this event is a true example that we are all simply better when we work together. The Wentzville Fire Protection District was the first to reach out to the WSD once learning about the planning of the event. Just as their mission and vision states, they serve the community in a dedicated, high quality and professional manner. Joining us this evening are Chief John Schneider, Deputy Chief Michael Scott, and Firefighter Paramedic Scott Holmes. The, the, fire, protection, the fire Protection District also worked with the Winsville Chick-fil-A to provide lunch for the volunteers who worked various roles do, during the vaccination event. Joining us this evening is the marketing director of our local Winsville Chick-fil-A, it's Ms. Parrot, Patty Parrott. Thank you all for your continued support and commitment to our community. Thank you. It's hard to believe it was two months ago, but this building was packed. It was exceedingly well organized. Uh, and one of the reasons we were able to pull off that particular vaccine pod was because of um, the stewardship in terms of the volunteer um, service of the firefighters um, of the fire protection district. And uh, the reason we were able to sustain is because of the food that was provided by uh, Chick-fil-A on that day. So your efforts and support are really and truly appreciated. Is there anything that you'd like to say? No, as always, we appreciate the support of the school district. We have a great relationship here in Wentzville. Thank you, and thank you to our friends at Chick-fil-A. That was great. 
appreciate it. I have been through this drive through multiple times, so is there anything you'd like to say? You know what I'm going to say? It was our pleasure to serve Winsville School District. I've heard that somewhere. I've heard that somewhere before. All right, if you'll join us in reciting our mission statement, learning today, leading tomorrow. Next up is public forum. For public forum, the board president will call the speakers to the floor. Each speaker shall be given, give his or her name and address upon recognition by the president. A maximum of 10 speakers will be allowed up to three minutes for their presentation, unless extended by the board president. If more time is required for the presentation, the citizen should consider district policy for placement on the regular meetings agenda. Due to the possible number of speakers during public forum, the board president may limit or extend the speaking time. If a number of speakers wish to speak on the same topic, the group may select a spokesperson to present that information. A speaker may address the board only once during public forum. Speakers may offer such objective concerns to the school operations as they deem appropriate. The board will not hear personnel complaints or hear personal complaints of school personnel nor against any person connected with the district in public session. Matters involving personnel shall be discussed by the board in executive session. An employee of the Winsville School District may address the board by following the public forum guidelines, regardless of whether the employee is a resident of the district. Up first tonight, we have Candace Dorff. Store. I'm a mother of four kids in the Winsville School District, grades four, fourth, second, and twins in kindergarten. I came here tonight to say if masks are required next school year, I will be pulling my kids from the Winsville School District. If vaccines become required, I will also be pulling my kids from the Winsville School District. If critical race theory or any lessons or programs even remotely related to critical race theory is implemented in the district, I will pull my kids from the Winsville School District. I'm speaking on behalf of my family, on behalf of parents who cannot be here tonight that share my feelings and who will be taking the same action of removing their kids from the Winsville School District. I hope you hear our collective voices and understand it is our right and responsibility to choose what we feel is best for our children and we deserve an answer now versus later so we move may make important decisions regarding our children's future. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next up is Crystal Bowman. All right, can you guys hear me? Uh, Crystal Bullman, 2106 Ebert Lane. So tonight, I'm not going to talk to you all about any of these hot button topics about quarantines or masks or uh, curriculum. Um, what I'd like to share with you with my three minutes is a tool that can be used to help guide you through this difficult time as a board. Um, I'll just provide you simple facts for your consideration. So first, uh, Wentzville School District School uh, Board Policy Regulation um, 0411 regulation states that in all matters not covered by the rules of the board parliamentary procedure shall be governed by Robert's Rules of Order. So Robert's Rules of Order is an effective tool to ensure efficient, civil, and effective meetings. These rules have been published and in use for almost 150 years their popularity and widespread use attest to its effectiveness. However, the rules work as a whole if all rules are followed to benefit the system as a whole. I'll just highlight a few for you. <clears throat> Above all, be courteous and be respectful. 
Decorum is essential to the process. Focus on the issue, not the personality. Listen to all sides because your vote may change. Always address questions through the chair, which brings me to the chair. A chair or president is a leader among equals. The presiding chair may debate because this is considered a small board. However, the appearance of impartiality is key to presiding over debate. Once a motion is made and seconded, the presiding officer may call on members for discussion. They should be selected by opposing views when possible. And no member should speak twice until all members have had a chance to speak once. Who can discuss? Members of the board are the only ones with the right and responsibility to speak during a meeting. Questions may be directed to subject matter experts, but only through the chair. This will reduce side conversations and confusion. Election to a board does not qualify you to lead. Leadership is, the, is not the result of electoral success. I love the simplicity of our school district's motto, learning today, leading tomorrow. Let's get back to education for today and setting a leadership example for tomorrow. Thank you for your time and your dedication to the school district. Thank you. Next up is Amy Benninghoffen. So I'm Amy Benninghoffen, and um, I am a little hoarse, I apologize, but I didn't want to miss coming here tonight to speak. I live at 11103 Spring Creek Lane in O'Fallon. Um, I'm just going to read from my thing because I'm very nervous. The burden of contact tracing and quarantining should not be on our teachers and nurses. If the county health department feels that contact tracing is vital, then they should train and hire their own contact tracers. As a frustrated parent in this district, I am trying very hard to not place blame on over quarantining on this administration, but something is not right. When children have to miss up to three to four months of school being quarantined and never once getting sick, something is wrong. We need to get to the bottom of this now. I realize that in order to remove the mask from our children, we, which absolutely has to be done, then contact tracing and quarantining due to not wearing a mask has to stop. There should not be, um, there should, I'm sorry, there would be no school district without students. You all have a duty to advocate for these children to get the best education they can. In order for that to happen, the COVID restrictions must be lifted. Tonight, I ask you all to join me in getting to the bottom of this. We all have a duty to return next school year back to normal for these kids. Let virtual learning be a choice. Let mask wearing be a choice. Then let's get back to educating our children and leave the rest behind. There's one more thing. This is the mask that my daughter wore all day yesterday. She is in third grade, nine years old, and this is the way it came home. This is what they're breathing in over eight hours a day, five days a week. The other thing, I want all of the posters that say wear a mask, be a hero, removed immediately. Stop programming our children. Thank you. Next up, we have Elena Hagedorn. Um, hello, my name is Elena Hagedorn, and um, my address is 214 Twin Birch Court Lake, St. Louis, Missouri. And I would just like to say that I go to school, and I am not in virtual, but I have been in virtual, and it was terrible. I hated it, and everything was just so out of control. My best friend, I knew that she was going to move last year, but 
school ended and that was the last day I ever saw her and I haven't got to see her since then and it was just really sad like you didn't know like that was going to be the last goodbye or and wearing masks my brother he always wears his mask and he comes home every day and his mask has gross spit all over it and it's just gross like they have to breathe in masks every single day including me and like everybody in the entire school has to wear a mask but it just I can't breathe in it and when I take my mask off my teacher always tells me to put it back on and it's like when I put it back on it hurts and it and I can't breathe and that's the problem and also schools should not be requiring masks masks should be an option masks should be optional and that's all I'd like to say Thank you. All right, next up we have Melissa Wolf. Good evening, my name is Melissa Wolf. My children don't attend Wentzville Public Schools, but we live in the district, so my tax dollars pay for this. I'm here to fight for the children affected by this mask mandate. Now I realize you'll point the fingers at the health department and they'll pass the blame onto the CDC recommendations. I'd like to talk, out, talk about it tonight. I'd like to talk about the info from the CDC themselves that completely contradicts their own recommendations. The CDC's most commonly cited study on masks found that masks resulted in only a 1.8% reduction in transmission rates. Another CDC study on a group of people who got COVID last July found that 70% of those people reported always wearing a mask and 14% of them often wore a mask. The CDC's own recommendations for K through 12 schools speaks to the fact that kids have a very low rate of infection and a very low rate of transmission. We know this. And let's not forget that in March of 2020, the CDC told us not to wear masks. For 30 years leading up to COVID, the CDC told us that masks don't work against viral spread. The science didn't change, the politics did. This is about compliance. I see some of you up there wearing it under your nose. What's the point in even wearing it? <sighs> masks are harmful to healthy people. Masks cause a drop in oxygen within 15 seconds of covering the mouth and nose. 15 seconds and they wear them all day long. Low oxygen saturation in the blood causes headaches, sleeplessness, and restlessness. That's in the short term. In the long term, for children, it can impact the development of their lungs and their heart. This is something that we cannot see until it's too late. Doctors are seeing increases in facial rashes, bacterial infection, fungal infections, and bacterial pneumonia is on the rise. This is because masks are dirty. Kids do not use masks in a sterile manner. There are psychological and emotional ramifications of a kid not being able to see their teacher's face. I know teachers who can't even remember some of their students' names because they don't have faces. How does a kindergartner learn how to read when he can't see his teacher's mouth sounding out the sound blends? So the benefits are marginal at best, per the CDC, and the risks include infections, rashes, headaches, sleeplessness, impacts on proper development of ch children's vital organs, psychological and emotional impacts. You can point the finger at the health department and CDC recommendations all day, but ultimately, you've imposed this harmful mandate. You have no right to do this. You are complicit in imposing unnecessary risks on children by forcing them to cover their faces and breathe through a dirty piece of cloth. For those parents whose children exhibit these, exhibit these signs of distress due to masks, I urge you to document it and hold these people personally responsible. Thank you for your time. Time is up. Next up, we have Joe Reese. Good evening, my name's Harold Joe Reese. I live at 14 Freddie Court, Wentzville, Missouri. Tonight I'm here to talk to you about some 
incredibly special children and staff in this district and inform you how the district and administration is failing them while receiving their own per personal financial gain. In 2012, when we had fewer students in the district, Winsville School District had three professionals working in the district that worked with the hearing impaired. In 2013, one of those positions was el eliminated. Uh, coincidentally, coincidentally, this was the same year the district hired a new superintendent. One of the remaining two teachers will be retiring from the district at the end of this school year, and members of this administration have made the decision not to replace this position. I can only assume due to district funding. Even after receiving hundreds of thousands of dollars in pay increases that were expedited for them personally and others in this district, they are still eliminating this much needed position. Since real numbers are appreciated by this administration Board of Education, here are some real numbers we need to think about. There are 66 students that receive hearing services in the district and a confidential number of students that receive services and live in the district but do not attend Winsfield School District. This information was provided to me by your administration. So let's use the number 66. In a five day, 35 hour school week, the one remaining teacher will be expected to write reports, communicate with parents, attend 504 IEP meetings as needed, meet any state requirements for their licensure, and travel from school to school and attempt to spend a little bit of time that is, uh, 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 attempt to spend the required amount of time with each of these 66 students. Maybe just maybe this teacher might even have a little bit of time to squeeze in a lunch. If you are doing the math as I have, this is not going to work. IEP and 504 plan require, IEP and 504 plan requirements that are not met will be opening this district up for lawsuits as these are state requirements. Not to mention this district would be failing this group of children. They need this time in order to meet goals, stay up with the rest of their class, and navigate life and school as a hearing impaired person. Board of Education, I ask you, are you ready to sit back and watch this administration destroy our once highly sought after district? Or are you here for children, for children and determined to make change as most of you campaign during your election? I will spend the next 45 seconds to let that sink in with this administration and board. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next up, Christina Thomas. Hey guys, it's me again. Uh, less than 24 hours after I spoke at the board meeting in November, my boys were all quarantined. I hope they don't experience that retaliation this time. Um, as a wife, I learned to advocate for my husband. As a mother, I learned to advocate for my children. As a nurse, I learned to advocate for others. I am not an outspoken person, so advocating was very much anxiety-inducing and stressful for me. Today, I'm here to advocate for our teachers. Looking back to 2018, 19, and 2020, all administrators' contracts were approved and offered a standard operating procedure and business practice during April and May, the standards set by the Wentzville School District Administration and Board of Education. Concerned about the April 6th school board election, long-standing business practices were abandoned. With the assistance of the Wentzville School Board leadership and at the request of the leader of the Wentzville School District, Wentzville School District administrators and cabinet members' contracts across the district were exp expedited and accelerated to be approved on March 18, 2021, instead of the usual April or, April or May timeline. Why is this important? In February, Wentzville teachers' salary increases and steps were frozen. Our school district is in double digit millions of dollars of debt, state funding is in question, and there's support staff and bus driver shortage. The Wentzville School District leadership and Board of Education leaders offered and approved hundreds of thousands of dollars in raises to themselves and other administrators across the school district. Over the last se seven years, the superintendent of Wentzville School District's income has increased $58,000, making significantly more than superintendent of Fort Zumwalt, who has been in that position for the, about the last 30 years. 
Uh, the Wentzville School District has the highest paid administrators and the lowest paid teachers in our country. This has to change. The administration has done nothing to merit these increases while our teachers have been bending over backwards to try and accommodate them. In layman's terms, and I know that nobody can see because the view was changed, um, but the teachers of the Wentzville School District are the heart of our schools. They deserve the rage of this, not the administration. Teachers, support staff, bus drivers in the Wentzville School District, please know that parents and students love and value you. I would like to end my statement by asking the board for a call of action. I call on the Board of Education to look within themselves. Putting politics aside, our children's education is not a political game. To pull together any remnant of dignity and integrity within themselves and consciously think about where our school district was and where it has, is headed. And with that in mind, I ask you to make a motion to go into executive session to evaluate the management and leadership skills and performance of the superintendent and his cabinet. Furthermore, I hope that the conclusion is, based on evidence provided, um, many uh, many evidences that Dr. Curtis Kane and his cabinet need to be fired with cause. All right, next up, Michael Wentz. Michael Wentz at 302 Point Loma, because um, these ladies have already kind of explained what has happened. Uh, my daughter was removed from school for not wearing her mask correctly, loved school, was looking forward to it every day to see teachers, kids. Now she's sitting in front of a computer pretty much this whole year. I haven't really seen any assignments that were for her to use a pen and on paper and write. We've picked up a few packets from school. And that's about it. And then we just feel discarded and betrayed by school. You know, I'm a taxpayer. This is not what I thought my tax money would go to. And I'm just asking for you guys, why are we doing this to the kids for the masks? We need to get rid of them. They need to go back to school, be with their friends, be with their teachers. And if it doesn't happen, I'm, pull, I'm going to do what a lot of other parents that I've talked to, we're pulling them out, we're doing homeschool co-op. I mean, we're just not, we're not doing it. And it's really sad. And I do thank the two members that have contacted me about my experience. Out of all of you that I've contacted, two of you have even made an effort to say, we're sorry that this happened. It really shouldn't have happened, but it did. We just felt like kicked out the door pretty much. So I just really hope you guys will reconsider and tonight try to make a decision about these masks because you have enough information out there that's showing that this is not working. So thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have Cindy Reedy. Hello, Cindy Reedy. My address is 2615 Preston Woods Trail. Um, so I had a whole thing like written out and then like the reality of the situation when I got here just kind of hit me and that went out the window. I think this is disgusting that we have to do this as parents come up here and tell you over and over again how these masks are hurting our children. I don't know how many of us, hundreds of emails maybe have been sent to you guys, phone calls, like you have the information, you do, not just from us. I know that you, if you have not researched this on your own, then you are not looking for a way out, and that is your job, to advocate for our children, to do what is in our best interest at, for our children. And if you're not willing to do that, then you need to step down, and you need to let somebody take your spot that will do that for us. Yes. This is not okay. This is actually, dis it's, it's heartbreaking. It is heartbreaking. My daughter came home again today with another migraine debilitating migraines. That's what's happening to my children. Not just once. They were home for a semester because I have them in three different schools. High school, middle school, grade school. And the inconsistency with you guys making a decision at the beginning of this made me just keep them home so that I can have control over that. But they were depressed at home. My girls were getting mentally depressed 
not seeing their kid, their friends, not being in school. So I sent them back. In that first week, within a week, migraines started. Headaches every day for my nine-year-old. It is not okay. Do any of you wear masks 40 hours a week? Do you? Do, does anybody in our society wear them 35 to 40 hours a week besides children? Do you understand that children are not affected by this? The vaccine, you've all probably been vaccinated, right? If it works, take the masks off. Take them off. And I, my child, my children will not be getting vaccinated to go back to school. If masks do not come off and CRT stays in or whatever you want to call it, we're all leaving. There is a huge amount of us. And if you're worried about, the, if you're not worried about that shift, if you haven't been looking at that and those numbers that will leave, <laughs> you're going to be surprised. The change is coming and either you guys will lead it or we will leave. Thank you. Next up, we have consent agenda. So please note that 11.14 has been moved to new business. And the minutes from 4.22, 14.5 has been amended as discussed. So we will need a motion to approve the consent agenda as amended. Excuse me. Excuse me, please. I'd like to pull one more item from the consent for the consent agenda. It would, okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. Our public forum time is over. I'll defer to the will of the board, but please know that we do require sign up prior to the start of the board meeting. There is a name that's crossed off. So uh, everyone who has signed up to speak is, did have a chance to speak. I would like to move that we let the additional speaker speak, please. Second. All, right. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. All right, those opposed? All right. Critical three, wokeism, CRT, is counterproductive to the very cause it champions. The emphasis on the amount of melanin on your skin perpetuate stereotypes and prejudice and itself is racism. This is not what united us. It's racist, it's divisive, it's anti-American and has no place in our schools, government, private institution or military. This school district has repeatedly denied my continual request to implement a political neutral curriculum. Instead, the teachers keep pushing and the principal and superintendent keep allowing CRT extension project 19, 1619 Project Hate Agenda to permeate in our school district, brainwashing our impression about children. This is on top of the mask mandates. It is insidious and it's evil. The supplemental material used by the teachers include and not exclude. The teachers were permitted to use BOM banner and LBGTQ plus banners on the virtual classroom locker room and the school district has allowed perhaps enable teachers propagandize their personal political agenda. B 
BLT Antifa cult hero John Brown was hold, <clears throat> was uh, was praised. This person hacked five men to death during a massacre, and yet it was applauded as a hero in the classroom. Prior to general general election, teachers sent out more scholastic publishing materials asking children to decide who they're going to pick as the future presidents. It is known that Scholastic is a woke propaganda machine. It gave Biden all glowing reviews and called the then President Trump racist as xenophobic who cares about economic recovery more than the people that are dying. Scholastic material took whatever agenda, lies, and talking points mainstream media uniformly adopted and disseminated to our children as the de facto truth. All the talking points and anti-Trump agenda have all but revealed or exposed recently by Project Veritas. But the points remain that the superintendents, principals, and teachers repeatedly deny my requests to keep the indoctrination and propaganda out of the classroom. In a way, I'm grateful that the remote learning allowed me to see what type of brainwashing has been going on to my children. I was shocked, I was heartbroken, and but can't help but feel, feel betrayed by the educators that are supposed to focus more on reading, writing, and math arithmetic than on being social justice activists who think math, hard work, and punctuality as white values. My grandparents and parents escaped Marxist communist China. Thank you. Time is up. All right. Moving on to consent agenda. Again, 11. Dot 14 has been moved to new business. And the minutes from 422, 14.5 have been amended as discussed. Was there another item to be pulled from consent? No. All right. So then we need a motion to approve the consent agenda as amended. Motion. Second. All right. Any other discussion? All those in favor, say aye. 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 Those opposed? Nay? Motion carries. Next up, superintendent reports. First up, federal programs, program evaluation. Yes, we have Dr. Megan Strzewski and Margot Mann will actually be uh, facilitating this particular presentation. Good, after, or good evening, everybody. We are happy to talk with you about our federal programs evaluation for the school year. As you know, we receive federal funds to support four different title categories in our district, and we'll review those funds with you. Our Title I funds are mainly focused on the instruction of students. Our Title II funds are mainly focused on the development of teachers. Our Title III funds are mainly focused on the instruction of students who are English language learners and immigrants. And our Title IV funds are focused on a well-balanced education, which includes um, supporting both a healthy and safe school environment, as well as advances in technology. Last year, we presented to you three goals that we worked on throughout the year. Those three goals included establishing an, uh, a system to monitor and analyze student growth in the area of reading, as measured by reading level data, which we met this year. We also had a goal to focus on professional learning for our literacy coaches in our Title I buildings as well as our administrators, um, and we were able to meet that goal as well. And then we had a continued goal to provide ongoing professional learning to our ELL teachers um, so that they can better support our students who are English language learners. And that's an ongoing goal because we're always working on providing professional learning, as well as this year, as you know, with COVID, we had to cut back on our professional development. So I get to share with you our title program highlights. We're excited to say we added additional reading interventionists to every building. All of our reading interventionists also are Orton Gillingham trained. 
we can continue to provide parent involvement support in both academic and mental health needs. We also continue our partnership with parents as teachers to provide support for our entering kindergarten program. We're also happy to say that we developed a district reading website to support both parents and students with reading. And we're excited to say we're continuing our summer book mailing program for students who receive extra support in reading. So let's share and take a look at our kids in action. So here's a couple pictures of our kids and in reading intervention, hard at work, as well as our ELL students too, working hard on their strategies. So I wanna share with you our proposed goals. We are looking to provide systematic, differentiated small group instruction for all students in grades K through five in the areas of reading and mathematics. We want to provide professional learning and collaboration time for school leaders, district building coaches, and classroom teachers in our Title I buildings to ensure that high quality instruction incur occurs for all students. We also want to ensure that intervention services and Tier one instruction practices are supported by systematic and purposeful building instructional schedules. And we wanna to continue to monitor, analyze, and utilize student performance data to meet the needs of all students through regularly scheduled collaboration meetings facilitated by our administrators. Do you have any questions? I have a question, please. Um, the reading website that you guys were talking about, can parents find that on our district website? Right now, it's on, gonna be posted on every building's website. Um, we also have it gonna be posted to our social media account, so we just literally finished it last week, so that might be another option, but it is like on every, it's gonna be posted on every building's website. So I have noticed that we have, uh, in the suggested or the new people for the upcoming year, that we have seen a significant amount of the reading interventionists. Do you know at what, do you know the total amount that we now have and what did we have before? Like let's say a year ago before, before the COVID. So we, we've added 13, so we're at a total of 13 reading interventionists across the district. We have 33. Oh, we, we had 13, sorry, we had 13, we added 13, so we have 33 total in the okay. district, yeah. 33 total. I was gonna say, I remember seeing quite a few on that. Yeah, on yeah that there list, are quite so. a few more, which is a great thing. And at what level um, are you basically, uh, what, what grade level do you see most of this intervention in reading? It really varies by building, um, but we service kids K through five now, so it depends on where um, the highest needs are is the kids that we service. It's based on criteria. And would you say that our students are, I would say reading proficient, would that be the correct word? Would you say that for school, the grade levels, that our students are proficient in reading at that level? I would say that's what we're always working towards, but our reading interventionists serve the students that are behind. Then how, about how long would, how would you do, how would you measure as far as how they're uh, moving forward with that? How do you actually measure that? So we measure it by several different um, assessments. So the big one is the reading levels that we use and that all teachers monitor monthly. 
but for our kids in reading interventions, we also use a past assessment, which monitors their phonological awareness, and we also use a QPS that also measures their phonics growth. So we use those three components to kind of measure their growth. Thank you. So Bates, if I could please. Yes. A uh, question for you, as we're talking about reading interventions and being on task, at what, what percent of our K-5 students are at grade level or above? I don't have the exact data in front of me, uh, but typically we end the year anywhere between 70 and 80% of our students on grade level. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next up is the Mental Health Resource Hub. Yes, Dr. Jerry Lebrot and Chris Turner are going to lead this particular um, update for the Board of Education. As we know, uh, there's been a tremendous amount of just activity that's been occurring this year. Uh, and we did not want this presentation to occur in June. We wanted this presentation to occur in the month of May so that um, not only um, our community, but also uh, parents specifically had an idea of what resources were going to be available um, to them, not only as this year came to close, but also over the course of the summer as well. As much as we focus on the um, cognitive or um, classroom-based instructional needs of students, it's important that we're thinking and considering the holistic or the whole child needs of students as well. And so mental health is absolutely a critical part of that component. And that's why we are going to discuss this hub that is uh, really close to being ready for uh, launch. And then we'll talk about that as well. So ladies, please. All right, I'd like to start by thanking President Bates and the board for the opportunity to showcase a new part of our website tonight that focuses on mental health supports. Uh, mental health support has been a strong uh, factor of the Winslow School District and the Student Services Department in an area of focus for several years. Um, Chris Turner is our lead educational support counselor. She does a fabulous job of leading our team of clinical therapists, uh, clinical licensed therapists. We have a one-to-one -one ratio in each of our secondary buildings. We have three educational support counselors at Pierce Hall, and we have a two-to-one ratio in our elementary buildings with having a one-to-one -one ratio again in our early childhood center. Um, so our support system continues to grow for our students and um, in kind of assessing where we are this year Chris and I were having discussions and um, along with board members and other members within the student services department about what exactly do we offer our students and how do we showcase that to our community and how do we make sure that they're able to navigate um, those opportunities and know what's out there for their students um, help is there but as a parent where do you start how do you get that what does the school implement for everyone, and how can we access more? Um, we also, in this particular website, discuss the different programming and supports that we have, the partner agencies that we work with, and again, providing info for parents to navigate what's available for their students. Um, we want to take the opportunity to share, share some of the offerings and supports, how to get the help that students may, or parents may need for the students, and where that help is. And I'm going to have um, Chris collaborate with Mr. Derek Dockett, and Derek will kind of go through each part of the hub and show you what's available, and it is live as of now. Hi, uh, Derek, if you want to click on the mental health support in school. So as you go through each of those pictures and click on the link, you will be then redirected to something that will either give you some more information about what's happening inside of our schools or some resources that families can connect with outside of schools. Um, and please know that this is a work in progress that we will continue to add to as we find new available resources uh, that can help our families. Okay, so that's the mental health supports in a school. The next one is the agency partners and curriculum. So these are all of our community agencies that come into our schools that either provide classroom-based prevention or one-on-one -on -one intervention with students. So it's a little description about each of those, and if you were to click on each of the agencies, it will take you right to their website to receive some more information about them. Okay, and then next, if you go back, yeah, there you go. 
the mindfulness activities for learners. Um, this was the most fun for me, of course, I think. Um, as you all know, when I present in January, I love the different activities and hands-on things that we do with our students. So this particular um, place will take us to different activities that you can do with your um, parents can do with their students or as they're accessing our website. There's the fish that I know some people were looking for after our last presentation, so there he is on our website. Okay. And then this link will take you to different counseling resources as well as hotline numbers. And again, each of those um, will take you to the link of the agency to give you a little more information. Substance abuse resources similar to the counseling resources. Suicide prevention, the same. There's also a link to the suicide awareness prevention and intervention guidelines, and that it will take you to exactly what we do in our district and who your support people are within the buildings. Um, grief and loss resources. Same, different tips. Um, we, as a, I know as an education support counseling team, we have been involved in many buildings um, when there has been a teacher death or a student death. And so one of the things we get asked for the most is how to talk to our children about loss of a friend or loved one. And so this, I feel like, will continue to grow as we get new resources to add to that. I know as a district, we send something out usually to parents, but it's also helpful um, when we don't know about the loss. There's a place to access that information. And then the last tab is just different common mental health issues. Um, that you might see in school age children and some information about that. And that is it. Any questions, comments? I would like to say thank you for all the hard work that everyone put in to create this resource for parents. And I was also wondering if you could go back under the mental health support in school area and kind of explain the graphic. Oh, sure, sure. If you uh, click on the accessing mental health support in school, that will take you to, if you're a parent and you're trying to figure out where do you even start, there I am noticing a concern with my child, where is the best place to start? Where you want, that will kind of take you through what happens once you contact the school counselor in your building and the different levels of intervention. It might be that the counselor is providing direct intervention with the student it might be that they're consulting with an education support counselor and then they're working to find a more appropriate referral. It might be an outside counseling agency. Um, and then there is um, also there is just the referral to all the in, in school interventions that we have with the community partners that um, was on the other, the other tab with the youth in need and um, chads and all of those different resources. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else? I have a question. Yeah. In the year of COVID, we've now had over a year. And so as we've listened to our parents and we've heard about the many things and the challenges that young people have had because they haven't developed as, as adults yet. What do you think is the most significant issue that you have seen with the children? And do you and are you suggesting by the way you have your website, are you suggesting that things would start at the school counselor because most of us would have an insurance policy that would cover our children. We may not wait for a counselor. 
kind of, a, so what is it that, what's the benefit of going through the school as opposed to your own psychiatric avenues? That's a great question. Um, I think any time uh, we as a society have change, it's difficult and many people process that change differently. What may be hard or difficult for one family may be very different for another. Um, and different people struggle in different ways. And so I think what we probably see more than anything is kids struggling with change, whether it's one way or the other, and, and how to process through that. Um, and again, that's many families um, choose different options when it comes to their health. Um, some of them may choose psychiatry, some of them may choose um, counseling sessions. Uh, some may not be ready to take that leap yet, and that's why we wanted to provide these options for families so that they had the literature at their hands and they could navigate the situation. Um, we as a school work with children 35 hours a week. That's a significant amount of time of where they are each week, and we want to be there for families to be that first line of intervention if they, cho if they so choose to have us help along that way. Um, our school counselors, our ESCs can provide that one-on-one -on -one support. And if we find that that support is, um, the need for that is more significant than what we handle at the school level, we have many partner agencies and even agencies that come into the school that we can refer those families out to. Um, we will continue to work with families to make sure that students get the services they need, whether that be in school, out of school, through our district or county system of care. Um, more than anything, what we wanted to do was make parents aware of how we can help and who can help and that we're here to help. The ESCs do an amazing job working one-on-one -on -one or in small groups with students that they know need help. What our purpose was with this out outreach is to make everyone aware of what's available because we don't always know initially exactly who needs help and some people may be um, quieter about it and this provides them a um, confidential opportunity to see what options are out there and how they can seek that assistance. And how many, how many people within the Wentzville School District employment do we have that are dedicated to this uh, mental issue? How many people do we have? Like counts? I, I, I'm we have counselors. 19 ESCs in the district right now. 19. I think that also it should be known that this is something that the community has asked and talked about over and over again. So in having the resources available and having the staff come up and present about it and show how to utilize the um, website and get to those resources, um, it's only going to benefit the kids in the district and there are families that don't have insurance or that have a really great relationship with the school and feel more comfortable talking to somebody at school versus going to see somebody that they've never met before. So basically what was the, aside from change, what was the symptom of the change that you saw mostly in our students this year? Well, I mean, were they more depressed? Were they anxious? Were they? I mean, I think that's hard to say um, without us really like taking a look at data and seeing, you know, why we got involved with children in the first place. So, I would say we've not seen um, anything different than we've seen other years. We still work with kids that have anxiety. We still work with kids that have depression. We still work with kids who aren't coming to school because they, you know, something's getting in the way of that, some maybe an issue that's going on in the home. So, so as COVID has been different for each and every household, so are you saying that you haven't seen an increase? I mean, obviously many of our kids haven't been in class, but what would you say that you were seeing? Were you seeing more of, of a situation? Uh, as opposed to less? Yeah, I would say that's I would say that's hard to say. I think that my ESCs continue to um, get involved with kids as needed. Um, so I think it's hard to say if it's 
more related to COVID or not, um, but they're still addressing the same issues that so, we've been in the seven years I've been here. So have you seen an increase, let's say from last March until this year, have you seen an increase of this situation with our young people, with our students and their parents? It's so been when, pretty so stressful when you say for everyone. It, it, absolutely, yes. absolutely. Um, I think, so right now, this is an extremely busy time of year for us, um, but that has not really changed. Um, I think every year from March to the end of the school year becomes a struggle for kids as they're transitioning into the summer. Um, so it's really hard to say if it's COVID related or not. I have. I mean, we're still as busy as we are every year. I don't know that it's any busier. I can say that we've seen, we, of course, we've seen um, an increase in particular situations related to COVID because, again, um, change is difficult for students, and we address those situations as they come. Each year brings different opportunities and, and different issues. And this year, you're exactly right. COVID is a hurdle that everyone is overcoming. So absolutely, there are issues that we address with uh, in regard to COVID. Early on in COVID of March of last year, one of the concerns that many of the, of the doctors had and such like that was absolutely the mental well-being of our students, of our, of our kids, and that other issues within the home, you know, whether it was child abuse or whatever the circumstance, they were very concerned, you know, health officials were very concerned because whereas a child would be at school, so a teacher or a counselor or even another student or friend, you know, could emphasize that particular struggle. But with all of our kids, you know, many of them being out a lot more this year than they'd ever planned, uh, I just was kind of wondering, you know, did you have more calls from did you have, you know, I, I would think that there was an increase. Was that, would that have been true, that there was an increase in calls about that? I mean, obviously the health department was very concerned about that. Absolutely. That's something that we 100% kept an eye on. We wanted to check with kids who we had not had a lot of contact with. Perhaps they were virtual and not attending. Um, sometimes we initiated those calls. Sometimes parents would call in to us and, and ask for suggestions or help. Um, so that's absolutely at the forefront. Um, and again, COVID presented a, a brand new issue, and I think it brought mental health to the forefront. It's always been an area of focus, and um, clearly it's, it's something that is a need from the community, has been a need from the community, and we want to continue to meet that need. So absolutely it has brought mental health concerns, and we are um, fortunate enough to have our ESC team that can help us meet those needs. Any other comments? Yeah, just real quick. Uh, you know, I, I just want to thank you for guys for putting this together. I think it's helpful to have, you know, kind of a one-stop shop that shows, I think there's a lot of things that I've learned um, just in the couple of weeks that we do. I had no idea that the district, you know, gave this opportunity for our kids. You know, certainly my family's benefited from counselor and, and, and support from the district. Um, I, I want to kind of put COVID aside, but I, I'm interested in the 19 ESCs and, and you hear, and we have heard, you know, awareness around mental health. It's been a very big focus for years. Thinking forward just about how we want to address that as a district and how we're staffed appropriately, expending appropriately. How, how are you thinking forward about what we need? Do we have enough? Is there a need for more things? I, I sense there is a need, and I'm just interested in your perspective moving forward. I would say that there is not a down moment in an ESC's day. So absolutely, um, we would continue to utilize those resources. Um, our long-term goal would be to have an ESC in each building. Um, and some of those special programs, as I mentioned, do have more. Right now, uh, we feel like we've made really good progress and understand that um, sometimes staffing takes time. Um, but absolutely, like I said, ESCs don't have downtime. They are always in demand. And if they are not uh, responding to crises, then we have them working in proactive ways. Thanks. Anyone else? All right. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Thank you guys so much for the opportunity and to Chris and the ESCs for putting this together. Thank you. Next up is our budget update. Yes, Mr. Angevine will provide a budget update. This is actually atypical. Uh, we typically don't have a May uh, budget update, but we wanted to provide one to the Board of Education since the budget will be presented to the board next month for, um, for approval. As Dr. Kane has just stated, we normally do not give a budget update, but we do want to make all the board members aware and the public aware of where we are heading into June. We're currently entering the final budget information into our systems for computation of the 2021-22 budget. Revenue and expense projections have not significantly changed since the March budget presentation made to the Board of Education. In March, we came to the Board of Education. We gave you a lot of specifics regarding the budget. Uh, this year, we've had a lot of changes that come on a regular basis in, in, in the way that we operate. Uh, but since March, we have been fairly stable with what the state has done and what the federal government has done and the direction that they've been heading. This year, in 2020-21, we're on a fiscal year, we could have a budget deficit up to $3 million with a fund balance percentage as low as 23.8%. And again, to remind you, a fund balance is the amount of saving, I guess you could call it savings and operations that we have to operate the school district. The district is anticipating a budget deficit of three to five million dollars next year, and that is what you're going to see in the budget that I'm going to present in June. We expect an operating fund balance percentage in the range of 17 percent to 22 percent of the 2021-22 budget. What that means is our savings will be in the range of 17 to 22 percent of our operating expenditures. The chart that you're looking at right now is our fund balance on the blue line and where our fund balance and the direction that has been heading over several years. The red line at the bottom is where we were anticipating to be before the state changed direction and gave back the money that they promised us. We like to be in the range of around 25% of our fund balance. You can see that we are dropping below our, our recommended 25% fund balance on the dollars that we li would like to have uh, to uh, in our savings account to operate the district. DESE recommends that school boards adopt the budget at the last meeting of the Board of Education prior to the beginning of the fiscal year. That means in June is when DESE recommends, and as we have always done that, recommends that the budget be brought to this board for approval. And a reminder that statutory provisions by law require the board to approve the school budget by June 30th of each year. The budget, as presented to the board in March and reiterated in this presentation, has not changed and is well underway and any changes would need to be made before the June board meeting. This is a budget update only, informing you that there have not been changes since March and that we are heading into our final budget in June and uh, no recommendation is being uh, recommend no recommendation is being made to the board at this time uh, regarding the the uh, budget coming up in june do we have any questions from the board if i could president bates um mr angevine could you make this uh presentation part of the uh board packet if you would please yes we we, we will uh uh, issue this board presentation, yes. If you would make it part of the board packet in the minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Question if I can. What do you have to believe, you know, going into next year in terms of assumptions to hit that range of three to five million? I'm thinking things like um, total enrollment, uh, revenue assumptions, and so, et cetera. What, what, what do you have to believe in terms of that to hit that range that you're proposing here? Well, what we do is we look at our biggest revenue factors and our biggest expense factors. Our biggest expense factors, of course, are salaries, which make up salaries and benefits, which make up 85% of our uh, expenditures. Uh, we started early uh, 
well, late last year in trying to determine and working with this board on what those uh, factors should be to know where we need to land on those expenses. The next two levels of expenses, uh, which only make up about 15% of the budget, is a combination of third-party expenditures, which includes everything from our, our lawyer's fees to our, our grass cutters to all the third parties, third-party transportation, uh, SROs, all those make up uh, about 7% uh, of the budget, and the final 9% is all of our supplies. And when we're looking at all of our supply budget, uh, what we're looking at is everything from band uniforms, to band instruments, to footballs, to, to paper, to uh, everything that we do on the supply side, and that is a very, very thin percentage. So not having a lot of room on the expense side, to answer your question specifically, we look at the revenue side. On the revenue side, what we do is we look at our largest revenues first, and our largest revenue, of course, is our assessed values and our tax money that we receive from our assessments. Uh, the first thing we do is make a decision on where we're going to be. We calculate a tax rate, which we present to this board in March. Uh, we use that tax rate to present it to the county, which is required on April 1st. We use that tax rate and those uh, estimates against the number we get from the county estimating what our assessed values are going to be. That is our largest number and we have to lock in on that number first of all to decide where we're going to be. The second largest number is our state funding. And as most of you know, our state funding is heavily guided on a formula that is weighted mostly in two areas. Those areas that we're weighting the formula on are enrollment and the other side is, is a, a factor which the state uses to hold back a percentage of those funds. Once we get those in line, we put those together to determine uh, where we're going to be. So to answer your question, what are the major factors? Those are the major factors, and those are the ones that we presented to you in detail in March. But yeah, those are the major factors that, that we use in trying to determine where we're going to be. We actually have literally thousands of, com of accounts come in from 21 buildings and all over this district uh, monitoring 2,500 employees and what they spend. Uh, all those numbers are put together in a single packet uh, of approximately 170 pages that is going to be given to you next month. Uh, we're well underway of that, and uh, that's why we're letting you know uh, what's involved and where we're going to land, and that it hasn't changed, thank goodness, because so many things have changed in this year uh, of COVID. But those are the major factors we use, and that's how we make that determination. Thanks, and I, and I think for enrollment, we're assuming like a pre-COVID number is where we land for next year? Uh, the reason we're using uh, pre-numbers, the state allows us use, to use the highest enrollment number of the last three years. Now, since enrollment went down, uh, we're not facing a budget issue if we use the guaranteed amount from the state, which is the lowest of the last three years. And that's the reason we're doing that. And we don't want to go higher than that because we don't know uh, what's going to happen in enrollment since it's already gone down. We really didn't expect enrollment to go down, but it did. And uh, until enrollment goes up, I don't think that it would be uh, financially responsible to put a budget together that would have a number that would be higher than what the state would guarantee us at this particular time. Thanks, Rick. Appreciate it. Thank you. Anyone else? President Bates, if I may. Um, are we anticipating any additional funds coming in for June or before the New Year starts, whether it be ESSER funds or any anything trickling down? Uh, we are expecting ESSER 3 to be announced. We don't have a, a dollar on that yet. It's going to be the largest of all the ESSER funds. That's not gonna, it could be announced this year and I have heard that we're going to have to have put a budget together for that very soon. But we haven't done that on ESSER 3. ESSER 1 and a lot of the CARES money has already uh, been spent this year. Next year, we are planning to use most of the ESSER 2 dollars. But as far as anything specifically coming in in the future, the only thing I know about is that ESSER 3 will be announced and we do expect that to be two times and possibly a little more than two times, excuse me, ESSER 3, and that could be possibly two times plus the dollars that we got from ESSER 2. One more question, if I may. Um, when do we expect to recover the enrollment loss that we experienced? Uh, when do I expect to get back the enrollment loss? 
I don't know. There are a lot of factors. Uh, what I have to do is be fiscally responsible and budget on what I know, the dollars that I know that I'm going to get. Uh, I wish I had a crystal ball to say when it's going to come back. Let me just say that before COVID hit, enrollment in this district, it was unprecedented to actually lose enrollment over a very, very long period. Uh, I, I'm guessing 15 to 20 years, we've just been growing, 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 and this is one of the largest, dis fastest growing districts in the state, which is one of the reasons that we're the highest uh, receiver of formula dollars in the entire state, is because of our growth. Uh, I was surprised that it went down. So, you, you know, uh, having an unprecedented factor in, in any business, when you have an unprecedented factor of what's happening that's never happened before, it really makes it very hard uh, to make a prediction in the future. And, and uh, uh, Director Stoley, I wish I could give you a, a number, uh, but I have to, I, what I can tell you is what I am using in my projections and what I believe is fiduciary, uh, financially responsible. Thank you very much. Next up is the WNEA Nurses Agreement. Dr. Hector, you want to review this particular? Yes, thank you. Agenda item, thank you. We negotiated with our um, nurses, and I first want to just acknowledge them as a group for the great work that they've done this year, um, just above and beyond what we could even imagine that people could do. So um, we came to the table with them, and we reached an agreement, uh, which is in your packet. If you have any questions about the agreement, the notes section describes uh, the conversations that were had, and we recommend approval of this agreement that was ratified by their membership. Thank you. All right. Do we have a motion? So moved. Do you want to make the motion? Motion. All right. So we need a motion to approve the WNEA nurses agreement as presented. Motion. Second. Any further discussion? All right. All those in favor? Say aye. 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 Those opposed? Nay. Motion carries. Next up, sanitary sewer easements. We need a motion to, do we have a presentation on this piece? No. Okay. So we would need a motion to approve the sanitary sewer easements as presented. So moved. Second. Do we have discussion? All right. All those in favor? Say aye. 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 Those opposed? Nay. Motion carries. Frontier Middle School, change order one. If, if I may just interject really quickly here. Um, I just want the board to note and the public to note that as you look at the change orders themselves, if you look toward the second page, I believe it is, of the change order, uh, there's a second box. This is the last page of the change order, the entire document itself, but there's a second box that talks about a change order review. Mr. Blanton, as you um, actually introduce this change order, if you could just discuss what's embedded within that change order review, I would appreciate it. Yes, this change order, uh, Frontier Middle School, change order number one, uh, in the amount of $2,602, uh, reflects the cost to add two steel beams uh, to support rooftop unit number 13 that were omitted from the contract drawings. This is the first change order. If you look at page two, this is the first change order to this project. Uh, we have a $250,000 contingency. Uh, approving this change order would reduce that contingency to $247,398. And as you can see in the second box, uh, which I'll include this in these change orders and on all future change orders, uh, that has been designated a design team issue, and that accounts for three one hundredths of a percent of the contract value. So if that's number 13, how many rooftop so we need units? A, we need a motion before okay. we can have discussion. Yep. Do you want to make a motion? Oh, 
Okay, I'll make the motion to approve the Frontier Middle School change order one as presented. Okay. We have a motion and a second. Discussion. Second. Now we can have discussion. Okay, so if that's number 13, how many rooftop units are on that job? I do not know that off the top of my head. But I'm assuming the rest of them had the steel support in there? That and is that correct. Was, so I guess I would ask how they miss one on when there's clearly there's at least 13. The steel was inadvertently left off the structural steel drums. I appreciate what you have done with the change order review mm -hmm. as a part of this document. One of the things, however, that I had asked with the change order, and I don't think I see it on this, and that is who is the vendor or the construction person? At the very top of page two, uh, Frontier Middle School Classroom Edition, Lawler Corporation. Yes. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. It's in the little sorry. part. Okay. I see that. Thank you. Any other questions or discussion? All right. All those in favor? Say aye. 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 Those opposed? Nay? Nay. Did you, did, we, did you get that? Do you want I, do you want to do a roll call vote? Did you hear it? I think it was three. Motion carries four to three. Next up, Frontier Middle School Edition Commissioning Services. I make the motion to approve the Frontier Middle School Edition Commissioning Services as presented. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? I have a question. <coughs> On any of these items that were looking for a commissioning agency, there was a wide variance, uh, significant enough that you had no choice but to pick the one you did. So, but I'm kind of wondering, uh, since that seems to be, I'm not exactly sure. I think that we saw that that came into effect in 2016, but was this? Was this, I mean, this is already a school that, that we have, have already done. So this would be, this would have been the issues that after the school was built to begin with anyway. So now with all the various things that we have had done, we are just now required to get this commissioning agency. I mean, why are we doing this now? It's a code requirement due to, to the size of our project. We'll be a commissioning agent on Frontier on South Middle, but we will not need one on Wentzville Middle due to the size of the project. So this actually came into effect, in, what was it 2015 or 2016? Because I did look it up. I want to say it was tw the 2017. 2017, okay. So we know that that, that is, has been approved by the city of Wentzville. So would we have had we had been doing anything, so that was in 2017. This school would have been done already by then, correct? Do you remember yes, when it that, was Yes, that is correct. Okay, so we didn't have a commissioning agent at that particular time. No. So I guess I'm just going to ask a question. Would we have gone back to that same commissioning agent? This is the first time uh, these schools have had a commissioning agent. Had, uh, if we get to the point where we're commissioning a building we've already commissioned, Yes, that would be that would be something we would look into, as they would have a a, a baseline. Uh, it might be cheaper for them to uh, move forward having all the historical data. Correct. Thank you. Any other questions or discussion? All right. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Those opposed? Nay. Motion carries six to one. 
Next up, Winsville Middle School, change order one. I'd like to make the motion to approve the Winsville Middle School change order one as presented. Second. All right. Any questions or discussion? I'm sorry, I did have a question on okay. this one. In this particular one, you indicate that, <clears throat> I'm sorry, that there were delays by the manufacturer, right? Uh, there's product, production okay. delays uh, for the bar oh, joists production. only. Uh, the well, earliest we'd receive those is in August, and we need to have the, the building done by then. So we redesigned the roof supporting structure so it was done with I-beams and not bar joists, therefore eliminating the production delays, the effects project. So <clears throat> what it says here is that Due to production delays in bar joist manufacturing. Yes. So that's so that wasn't what you had said earlier. Was it? The, I'm sorry. Was I expecting it was a delay because of something else? No, no. This no, is it was this. Okay. Just right. production. Okay. And why do you? Why did we have that problem? Do you know? I bet I do not know, but we're experiencing production delays basically across the entire construction industry right now. It just so happened that uh, bar joists were affected on this project. So given that fact that we should probably expect that we're going to be looking at some of these other things, especially if they called for that bar joist from the manufacturer that we use? Correct. We have. But this is the... Uh, this is one of our newest projects. The other projects that we already have bid and are underway, they've locked in their production time slot. So I do not expect, I do not expect any more as far as bar joists go, but there will be, I anticipate there will be delivery delays on a lot of construction products. <coughs> okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or discussion? All right. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. Motion carries. Next up, South Middle School, change order one. I'd like to make the motion to approve South Middle School, change order one as presented. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All right. No discussion. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Those opposed? Nay? Nay. Motion carries six to one. South Middle School, change order two. I'd like to make the motion to approve the South Middle School, change order two as presented. Second. Motion and a second. Any discussion? Um, I would ask on this one, do... Do our other schools have this emergency asphalt turnaround? I want to say some do, yes. I would have to check into that. Uh, so they were just suggesting we do this? It, uh, this came after we bid the project. We do have an emergency uh, services drive that goes around the school. After we bid the project, they did request the ability, which would allow basically one-way traffic. They requested the ability to basically put in a, a driveway turn, turnaround. Okay, so the way it's set up now, though, they're, they're very capable of coming in and out and in case of an emergency, correct? In my opinion, yes. Okay. So I guess I want to clarify because... So it is a recommendation or a request? It's a request from the Winsville Fire Protection District. And could it impede the project if we do not approve it? Correct. It's a request and I see that as a requirement. Excuse me, I have one yeah. question. <clears throat> Unfortunately, we are looking at extreme price increases relative to lumber that I know of specifically. But we have now 
we do have a lot of asphalt work that's going to be going on this summer. Are you getting, are you getting uh, adjusted price increases at this time? I mean, I, I'm not sure how the asphalt world is going, but I would suspect it probably is, just like the rest of it. For what we have locked in, we haven't received any price increases request yet. However, I do hear rumblings uh, throughout the construction industry, and I do anticipate receiving some of those requests in the future. Do you think that there's going to be any uh, issues relative to uh, slowdowns at all? because of this. Not this with is it. going to be, you know, part gasoline, I mean, an oil issue. Right now, I don't see it for asphalt for the district. Uh, okay. we're, we're not doing that much. Uh, our, our middle school, our high school, that's all concrete. Uh, so we're doing a relatively small amount. I think we'll be okay there. Okay, thank you. And oh, there's a, sorry, if I may. Good. Can you just please clarify the difference you said at first it was a request but then you said it was the requirement can you clarify that a little bit and then can you also explain how it, if this doesn't move forward how it could impede the project please yes this is this is a requirement from the Winsville fire protection district uh, they did make a request for it but this needs to be included in the project if we do not include it in the project we may not get our life safety uh, occupancy permit which would prevent us from occupying this portion of the school. Thank you for the clarification. So then are they gonna start enforcing this at all the middle schools, high schools, and grade schools? I, if I understand your question, the answer is no. Are they going to have us add this to existing schools? No. Uh, the request is since we're building this service road to put the turnaround in at the same time. So do, do we have that set up at the new middle school? It's not an issue at the new middle school due to basically all the paving that's around it. This uh, addition is kind of being built kind of out in the field, and we had to get a road around that. There's really no parking around it, and they wanted a turnaround basically out in the field. The other schools are set up different, and this isn't necessary. Question, if I could, please. Um, yes, Dr. Shabos. Did they approve the plans? Yes. And this request has came after they approved the plans? That is correct. Thank you. All right. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Those opposed, nay? Nay. Can we do a... a can we do a roll call vote? I just couldn't pick all that up. Okay. Uh, Vice President Bryce. Hey. Director Abbott. Aye. Director Garber. Aye. Okay. Uh, Director Stoley. Aye. Okay. Secretary Shaper. Director Goodson. Aye. And President Bates. Aye. That was 4-3. So motion carries 4-3. South Middle School, change order 3. I'll make a motion to approve the South Middle School change order 3 as presented. Second. We have a motion and a second. Do we have discussion on this item? I have a question. Apparently, according to the plan, that we were going to put flooring in four restrooms in a newer part of the building. But now that's been replaced with the other plan now of putting, uh, replacing the existing, uh, the existing tile flooring in two restrooms that are near the main gym. So I'm wondering uh, if this was a new part of the building, so will the floor be like a stamped concrete or something in those bathrooms? Or I mean, are we addressing the flooring 
in any way on those four? Yes, these are existing restrooms. And as part of the new project, we were replacing uh, tile flooring with epoxy flooring. The four restrooms that it was called to redo that, those restrooms are in pretty good shape. We can get a few more years out of them. However, there were two older restrooms that weren't part of the project. So what we did was eliminate work in the four restrooms that were part of the last edition and replace uh, the flooring, the tile flooring with epoxy flooring in the older restrooms. And is epoxy flooring, is that going to be probably the norm? Yes, okay. that's what we'd like to do. Right, yes. Thank you. It's seamless. Yes. All right, all those in favor? Say aye. 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 Those opposed? Nay. Motion carries. South Middle School Edition Commissioning Services. Make the motion to approve the South Middle School Edition Commissioning Services as presented. Second. Any discussion or questions on this item? I do have a question. Since I didn't, I don't really know. Are, is this commissioning agent, is this one we've now been using or you're familiar with? Yes, they are actually the commissioning agent right now on the new middle school. Uh, they'll be the commissioning agent on Frontier Middle School, and if approved here, they'll be the commissioning agent here. Because I noticed that their prices were half? Yes, they're, they're already the working in the district, and, yeah. and that's to their benefit. Any other discussion? All, right. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. Motion carries, six to one. North Point High School, change order 33. I make the motion to approve North Point High School, change order 33 as presented. Second. Any questions or discussion on this item? Yes, I do. I So this point, Prairie, oh, let me read this real quick. Where is this road, North Point Road, widening? Is that is that the city road or is? It's the, the county road or the country road off of West Meyer Boulevard that goes to the north. So do we own that road or is it? No, but uh, as part of the high school, we were uh, charged with widening the road and then as part of the middle school project, we were to add a left-hand turn lane. So both of which were on the civil drawings? Yes, uh, the, the work was, yes. Okay, so then I asked, was the ground disturbed? The, the ground has been opened up, yes. So why aren't the people who opened up the ground um, responsible for a compaction test and meeting that compaction test for the road that we knew that was going there? when they did the compaction test, once they removed the, the old portion of the road, the ground will not achieve compaction and therefore we have to remediate it. Right, but that's when, you know, it's their responsibility to meet the compaction knowing the road is going in there. So then they do the levels of lift to get their compaction. And I, I mean, I don't see how we're responsible for that when we knew going into it, you know, on the civil drawing, that road was going there, and they're the ones that dug it up, put their utilities in. They should put it back to where it, 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 it so it meets the specs from when it started. Because if they wouldn't have dug that up, we would have met compaction on that. We, we had to dig it up as part of the widening and the, the turn lane. And I get that, but why wouldn't that be in their contract to... We, to, we wouldn't want to include unnecessary remediation in the project. We... Uh, I guess we could have, but that would have just added money to the front of the project, not knowing if we needed it. Once we open it up, we determine exactly how much we need, and then we move forward. Okay, so what I asked moving forward, I guess, is now they got to dig it back up, and then what they already dug up, then they got to put rock down, and then start compacting during lifts, correct? Because it's they closed up the ground? No, the, the ground is open right now. It will not meet compaction. We have a re recommendation from the district soils engineer of how far, how deep to remove and what to replace it with. Uh, once we approve this, then the work will begin. There's no work has begun yet. And then who would be the contractor doing the work on this? This would fall under, 
right construction. However, they have hired uh, Karen Brock. So why aren't we seeing a bid amount on on the uh, amount that you're asking for? This is an allowance. Uh, I, antici I anticipate. We think this is going to be right at forty-eight thousand dollars. However, I'm asking for an allowance of, of sixty thousand dollars, just in case we encounter some more prior to the June meeting. Okay, and then is this tied in with the middle school? There is a separate change order on the middle school project, which specifically addresses the turn lane portion. But is it in that same area, or no? It's in a different area. Uh, Mr. Blanton, if I could here, you kind of like to use that contingency fund. I notice we're about three and a half times over what our contingency was, 250000 but uh, just want to lay that out there. Thank you. All right. Any other discussion? Director Goodson, do you have something? Yes, if I may. Um, to, to Secretary Schaefer's point, the overruns there. Could you um, take, I, I assume we're pretty close in terms of change orders, getting this, this project tightened up. In looking at that number, could you could you give uh, me a perspective of the next lowest bid that existed uh, when we bid this original project compared to the new contract amount here? I want to say, if I remember, it was about a million five-ish higher, maybe a little more. I believe uh, that, well, this one's seventy-four million six one three, and I want to say the second lowest bid was a little over seventy-six million. Thanks. One more question, if I may. So I actually live right next to the high school and the road here, and, and, and been up Point Prairie quite a bit. I've no, I actually noticed this uh, soil was exposed for quite some time, and because you tore up the road, I mean there was you know flags up and cones up that kind of showed that you know there's a drop off off the edge of the shoulder it, it seemed it had been for quite some time is there a rationale or an explanation in terms of why you know we're now getting this maybe it's just timing between meetings but just just a perspective there timing between meetings is exactly that once we opened it up discovered we needed to remediate it uh, they will not proceed with the work until we get board approval so work on that area had to stop thanks All those in favor? Say aye. 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 Those opposed? Nay. Motion carries six to one. North Point High School street naming. Make the motion to approve North Point High School street naming as presented. Second. Any discussion question on this item? I think it's a great name. Who, who came up with it? I got to know. No one wants to raise it. I do not know the answer to that. Uh, it may have been a cabinet discussion. By May, it absolutely was a cabinet discussion. But I will tell you that Dr. Schellmeyer um, very much agrees with the name, uh, Grizzly Lake. Noted. <laughs> All right. All those in favor, say aye. Uh, aye. Those opposed, nay. Motion carries. New Middle School, change order seven. I make the motion, I make the motion to approve the new middle school change order seven as presented. Second. Any discussion or questions on this item? All right, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Those opposed? Okay. All right. Motion carries. Six to one. New middle school. Change order eight. I make a motion to approve the new middle school change order eight as presented. Second. Questions or discussion? Director Garber, did you have a question? Uh, all right. So this is the same company. This is the same situation. The remediation and the 
racists aside, this is the one that uh, now we're another 50,000 with this. Or is that correct? Much less. Yeah, 50,000. That is correct. So between 50,000 and 60,000, do you expect do you expect this to be less, like you had indicated on the previous one? Yes. By how much? About. I want to say this one. Uh, we're estimating it at thirty-eight thousand. Thank you. Uh, can I see can, after this work is done? Can we? Can you post the bill for this? Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. All those in favor? Say aye. 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 Those opposed? Nay. Motion carries, six to one. Up next, custodian of records. I make a motion to approve Kathy Delacruel as, yep. as the temporary custodian of records for the Winsville School District. Second. Second. All right, any question or discussion? We're going to miss you, Casey. Thank you for all of your hard work. Agree. All right. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. Motion carries. Board of Education Recording Secretary. I'm waiting a motion to approve Kathy Delacle as the temporary Board of Education Recording Secretary for the Winsville School District. So moved. Second. Second. Any questions or discussion? All right. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Those opposed? Nay. Motion carries. Please refresh. I think we have one item that was pulled from consent agenda. While the ref while the board members are refreshing, uh, I do want to speak on behalf of not only myself but cabinet as well. And Mrs. Gross, we will miss you and wish you all the best. Congratulations. I believe this item was pulled for a separate vote. So we would need a motion to approve the Marzano Resources Professional Learning Agreement as presented. So moved. Second. Second. Any discussion or questions on this item? President Bates, if I may. Yes, please. Um, I was just wondering if you could fill in the blanks for some of the school community who may not be well versed on this topic, just about proficiency scales and what it does and how it helps the students, please. Sorry, go ahead. Okay, thank you, and make sure I had permission. Um, uh, so actually, currently, our curriculum already includes proficiency scales, so all of our curriculum is accessed on our website um, under the Teaching and Learning Department, under Curriculum, and you can see all of the curriculum for every uh, course that we teach, as well as every grade level. And um, many years ago, well before my time, proficiency scales were a part of our curriculum writing. So we've been doing this work for a long time. Um, what a proficiency scale does is it helps outline to a teacher and to a student how to earn um, proficiency. So, for instance, if the goal is to analyze text uh, with critical thinking, um, it would tell you how to do that at a proficient level. Um, the idea behind it is that students always know how to get there, as well as teachers always know how students are progressing. Um, so it really just takes like assessment and grading and makes it more come alive for the student and for the teacher versus um, what would have been a more traditional grading method like in our time or my time, I'll speak only for me, my time, um, where you got a paper and the grade was on top and that's all it was. That doesn't mean we don't grade all kinds of different ways, but part of our curriculum includes proficiency scales to guide the teachers and the students. Okay, anybody have any more questions before I ask another question at this point? No one? Um, just following up, you said, um, or I, I think what you were trying to say is, obviously we have these in, our, in some of our schools, our K through second graders. Can you explain to parents how they can also monitor and track their students' progress and look at these scales as well? Because I believe that they can, right? But I think mm -hmm. a, lot of a lot of parents may not know where to find that. 
Yeah, so on the website, under curriculum is where they would find it. So for instance, if you're a fourth grade parent and you wanna look at math and look at what are the standards in math, so we teach based on the Missouri Learning Standards, so all of our curriculum is aligned to the Missouri Learning Standards. You would see the standards, you would see actually the units, you would see what our learning targets are for that unit, what are the goals are for the students. Um, and then at the end, you would see the proficiency scales for those standards. Um, so if, if you wanted to know, like if they, are in kindergarten and the goal is to count from zero to 100, you know, how would they get there and what would that look like? That would be in the proficiency scale. And then as far as data, do we have any quantitative data that, that might tell us um, how this has benefited students since we implemented these proficiency scales? I can't really speak to, I mean, this started a long time ago, so I don't, I can't speak to that specifically. What I would say is um, proficiency scales aren't new, but we can get better in our use of them, which is kind of the goal behind this professional learning is we have them, we know that they're really useful. How do we help teachers to use them um, even more? And how do we help kids to use them even more? And kind of like your question, how do we help parents to know that those are there and available to them to also kind of be watching their child grow and like it, how they're understanding the various standards. And then could you just please share, I know that we kind of had some communication exchanging back and forth that, that this is not a replacement for something that we currently have as far as our traditional grading. Right, yeah, this is not, it, this is not a difference or any, it, this is not new. Um, so I kind of explain the way that we uh, tackle curriculum and assessment and development is that we feel that we should always be learning more and growing more. So uh, we are always looking for ways to grow our curriculum teams and our assessment teams. Um, so that's why we bring in this professional learning and we uh, use more of a train the trainer model in the Wentzville School District because we have thousands of teachers. So what that means is we have groups of people get this training directly from the source and then they provide that learning to whether it's grade levels or um, teams at the high school and middle schools and et cetera. So that's why um, we set it up this way. All right, thank you. Any other questions? All right, all those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. Motion carries. So next up is old business, and this was an item asked um, to be on the agenda by Secretary Shaper. I think he wanted to have a little discussion and possibly clarification on the grade span motion that was made previously made in 2019. Excuse Sorry. me, could I add, could I say something, please? Sure. Um, when we were talking about the consent agenda, I had asked that we pull 11.13. And I didn't, when I refreshed, I didn't see it. It's still not there. I apologize, I didn't hear that. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's, it's already been, been voted upon. Do you have a, a question or clarification that you need on it that we could answer? Well, I wanted to ask questions, some questions on it as well. But I'm sorry, but I thought we did ask to ask if there was a change in the in the consent agenda. And I do believe I said loudly enough that it was eleven point thirteen. Yeah, I apologize I didn't I didn't hear that you pulled something. So are you saying that the vote stands then, even though I'd ask for it to be pulled? I mean, I'm happy. Do you want to speak to that procedurally, Casey? So it's been voted on and it has been approved um, in the consent agenda. I'm with I'm with Betsy. So you, yes, you had said you would like to pull something, and it, it and the number was not said. I didn't record that, and then we had the discussion about one eleven point fourteen being pulled, and then we said that the amended um, minutes would be approved as amended and then that was I apologize I did not hear a number ever I thought I thought 11.14 was actually the one you had intended on pulling and when you realized it was pulled you didn't say the number that was how I interpreted that because I did not hear one um, it has been approved but if you'd like to ask your questions feel free to ask your questions at this time 
you'd like to ask some questions about it. Okay. In, in the first place, but uh, again, this is Ms. Labrat, and so I'm concerned about the consulting. As does this, is this part of the new website and the, and the enhanced part of mental mental health for children? Obviously, I mean, this seems to be. I think I read in here that the monies that was going to be used for this comes out of the one percent of the state funds. Correct. Correct. So it says that, but it's thirty-four thousand dollars for seven weeks of on-site consultation between September of 21 to April of 22. So I guess I'm a little bit concerned because we're looking at uh, emotional development for traumatized children, students, correct? President Bates, may I? Um, yes, yes Director Robert. Garber. So this is Growing Edge Training. Growing Edge Training provides um, two professional development courses that the Winsville School District has taken, uh, taken part in over the last several years. One of those is called The Art of Kid Whispering. It's a two-day training. The other is called Life Space Crisis Intervention, and it's a four- to five-day training. In those particular trainings, um, we work with educational support counselors, as we mentioned in our presentation earlier. So it, it's not a direct correlation, but it absolutely um, falls in the same realm in providing services to students. Also, we train all of our new administrators, our guidance counselors, many of our teachers um, receive this training, as well as some of our support staff that work with students um, who need extra support. This particular training helps students navigate conflict, helps, um, it helps teachers help students navigate conflict. Also, um, teaches our staff how to have conversations with students that don't just get to the um, why the behavior happened, but how it started and how we can um, navigate those issues in the future to have maybe a, a lesser of a behavioral issue or a concern. Um, just trying to get to the heart of the problem, help the student understand maybe the emotions they're feeling and how they can um, solve those problems in um, restorative ways. We do have um, two or sorry, we have a four-day training, and we also have seven weeks of consultation where um, the service provider comes. So we, we have a four-day training. We train our administrative teams. We train our, like I said, our educational support counselor, our guidance counselor, all of those people who have not had training before. And then the trainer comes back monthly, a week at a time and follows up with that training and, and provides coaching for that and ensures that everything that was taught during those four days of training um, is understood and is being implemented in the field and uh, provides answers to any questions that we may have, um, checks in on student, uh, on student status, and um, provides direction if the staff has any question. So it said, it indicated here that there would be up to 30 participants. So those are the people that you indicated. Yes. counselors, teachers, those, those people. One of the things that I was reading in this agreement was, <clears throat> this would have been on, I guess this is page two, and it said that this particular company, Growing Edge Training, that they will also offer graduate credits through Augustina University for participants in the LSCI training who complete the entire course. It's an additional fee of $300 per registrant and is, uh, <clears throat> and is required for three graduate credits and additional assignments that must be completed. Who, who pays the 300? The person taking the course. So if we had a teacher who was seeking a master's degree or a master's plus 30, um, they are participating in that professional development if they so choose outside of the school day to complete additional assignments in regard to that learning and pay the additional $300, then that is an option for them outside of the confines of their employment. So this does not come out of the state funds? 
So at all. We, we not the three hundred dollars. No, absolutely Correct. not. All right. Okay. And uh, I think that was about. I think that was it. Except. No, I think that was all. I think that was my questions. Oh, right. thank, thank you for your you. questions. Uh -huh. Sorry about that again, Director Barber. I said I apologize that we overlooked that. Oh. Secretary Schaefer, do you want to talk about the, the grade span? If I could, please. Uh, first of all, I gave uh, all the board members a packet there a little bit, uh, maybe to follow along and set a little history of how this has came about and what has led to this problem. You might find that I'm a little repetitive in some of this as we go through it. However, I think uh, the reason is that I am doing that is because uh, this is establishes how this was permit, presented and how we should go forward. Um, page one, or A and page one on that. This was presented to the board by Dr. Kane uh, at the September 19th meeting, uh, 2019. And it was, I recommend I am recommending we open the new high school during the 21-22 school year with freshman, sophomore, and junior classes. Student or senior year will remain in their current school for the 21-22 school year. I'm also recommending we offer students in their junior year during the 21-22 school year the option to remain at their current school for both their junior and senior years without district provided transportation. brings us to B, page one. It starts at the bottom. It's new business. Uh, this is the minutes uh, that was uh, of the September 19th meeting and the October board packet. Uh, once again, it starts out with a presentation that I just read that Dr. Kane gave to the board. As we move to B, page two, there was uh, some discussion there and um, as you would notice in that second line about the middle, the workshop expression question were submitted to me, submitted to Mrs. Gross as soon as possible uh, to frame out the work session uh, that is coming up after this. So, and then, then it goes on to say grade span questions, not boundary questions. So no boundary was it yet uh, to be presented with this grade span. And I will uh, also later show that the boundaries did not come up until uh, after the grade span was approved. So basically it says here grade span questions, not boundary questions. This was voted uh, that we would uh, uh, table this, uh, moved by President Bates at the time and second uh, by Director Reeder. And that passed by a 7-0 vote uh, that it would be tabled. This brings us to C. Uh, this is the minutes of uh, November 21st for a special meeting, I believe this was, on October 16th. As you move down to the bottom of page one, it uh, starts out uh, with the demographer and the grade span for the new high school. But more importantly, as we move through it, and after some discussion, we'll come down there after you see the short break for the meeting, the open, ses open session resume. And from the discussion that was had, and this mirrors Dr. Kane's recommendation, except for one point, and I'm sure you'll pick it up in here, uh, that this was also offered to one class lower than Dr. Kane's. Other than that, it does mirror it. Secretary Buchanan made the motion to open the new high school during the 21-22 school year with freshmen, sophomores, and juniors. Student or senior years will remain in their current high school for the 21-22 school year. Students in their sophomore and junior years will have the option to stay at their current school until graduation without district provided transportation. Uh, this motion was uh, second by President Bates. As you can see, the vote was overwhelmingly unanimously 
was a 7-0 vote by voice call. This brings us to uh, D1. And the only reason I put this in here, this is when the boundary recommendations were discussed. This was in the December 19th meeting of 2019 uh, minutes reflected in the January 16, 2020 board packet. And basically what I just brought this here was to say that boundary discussion had never came into the picture on what had previously been voted for by the board. This brings us to uh, E1. This was a notification that went out on 827 of, of 20. It was a high school selection notice. Next year, sophomores and juniors have a high school option. I, I am going to read this in its entirety because it does have some benefit, I think. As you know, the District 4 High School is currently under construction near the intersection of West Mile Road and North Point Prairie and Winslow is scheduled to open next year for freshmen, sophomores, and juniors. You have, been, have, you have been identified as living in the new high school boundaries. It says that naturally this would be because this is what affected the students that were given the option. They would have to be living in that time for the defective. Uh, having students junior for the 21-22. The Board of Education has approved the new boundaries as well as the following guidelines for those who attend the new school. I'd like to back up and say, once again, there has been no mention of any residency requirements in this option. Students who are currently in the eighth grade for the 21 school year will be assigned to a high school based on their residential address. Once again, this talks about eighth grade students only. This does not reference any students who want to maintain and want to exercise their option. Students who are currently in the ninth and 10th grade for the 2021 school year will have the option to remain in their current high school through graduation without district provided transportation or transfer to the new high school. Students are currently in the 11th grade, once again, for the 20, we will continue to attend the current high school for their senior year. This was notice was sent out prior to uh, the next item and the last that I will show you. It's a form where the parents and the student did answer or were required to answer by the 25th of September of 2020. So we come back to this and this is what the parents of the students had offered. The new high school will open on the 21-22 school year for freshmen, sophomores, and juniors. Students who are currently in their eighth grade, let me back up a little bit here if I could, and then I'll come back to this. The right-hand side is cut off. I would like to say that it says high school choice, 10th grade up at the top. I will, as I read this, I will give you uh, the complete sentence. Students who are currently in the eighth grade for the 2021 school year will be assigned to a high school based on their residential address. Once again, this talks about eighth graders only. Moving to the new high school is ninth graders. Students who are currently in the ninth, 10th grade for 20 will have the option to remain at their current high school through graduation without district provided transportation or transfer to the new school. Students who are currently in the 11th grade for the 2021 school year, uh, what was left out there was the 20 one will continue to attend the current high school for their senior year. Uh, down at the bottom says your selection is due by September 25th, 2020. In this case, it says whole high school. Also, students from Timberland received the same notice uh, uh, with Timberland in there. 
and the parents had the opportunity, or the students had the opportunity. My, my child is a current sophomore, in this case, at Holt High School and requests to remain at Holt High School for their junior through senior years. And they could answer somewhere yes. And in this case, it was answered yes. My contention here is, and you're going to hear from staff, that this was not meant the way it was wrote. However, I think it was approved by the board. I think it, in the reason it was offered, it gave stability to the students and the parents for the education environment that they would have throughout their high school if they was attending Holt and was affected by the move to North Point Prairie. Also, what I'd like to say is I have been asked, well, how many students does this represent? I cannot answer that. I can tell you, students have been denied already. Students are in the process of being denied. And we have sophomores there that'll be in this school for two years. If their family will make a change, they will be asked to make a change again. Once again, there was never no residential part of this transfer or this option. It is never stated. I ask for your support on that, on this issue. Secretary Chamber, do you want to clarify what, what your ask is? Like, I, I understand you went through the, the information, but do you want to give a little information on what your what the ask is of the board or what you're asking us well, to consider? What, what I would like to do, do here is, I mean, the option was is that we gave the students, the parents, and, and the option to create a stable educational environment. I would like to make, a, I will make a motion. I make a motion that we uphold the great span as it was presented with no residency restrictions. Second. Discussion, questions? Yes, I do. So in further clarification of what you were discussing, what, what the situation has presented itself now, correct, if I'm wrong, is that yes, a, a apparently... Very good question, was, because we're, we're, seeing, uh, we're seeing a movement, we're seeing some growth uh, within, within our district again, we're seeing some new houses being built, and we have people who are, are moving to a different location, and when they move to that dis different location, they're being told that you have a new address. You now have to go where your new address is. And and I think we, you know, I think that's gonna, we could have students start at a hold or start at a Timberland as a sophomore if their parents move. And like I say, some have been denied. Some in there are in the process, I guess, to be denied. And I look as this to be, if we don't solidify, uh, what our intent was, we're going to have this as an ongoing issue. So in this particular case, this person lived in the Holt area and they decided that they wanted to stay in Holt. But if they had decided that they wanted to, uh, but if they moved, now, now what, so what is the situation? What is a valid situation? Are you saying that some people now maybe have moved into another high school district, but they still want to go to Holt? Let's just use a Holt on this one. Is that what you're saying? We'll just take this for an example, okay. yes. Right. This person lived, lived in the North Point Prairie, still lives in the North Point Prairie, but they have moved. They live what is now established as North Point Prairie boundary but they have moved, but they're, now they're still in within the North Point Prairie. But I don't think that's necessarily the issue. The issue is that we're, if, if anybody moves and their address changes, they're, they're declaring a new residency and they're being forced then after they sign this intent. First of all, I don't know if we have a contract here. Let me say this. All contracts are agreements. All agreements are not necessarily contracts. 
However, you have consideration on both sides here. The school district has made the offer for that student to stay at their current high school. The parents have made the consideration that the school district will not have to provide transportation. So there's consideration on both sides. So do we have an agreement or a contract? I would say it's an agreement probably, you know. So with this particular one that, you're, that we were just talking about, they were in, they were actually in Holt and the new high school. Once the boundaries were done, right? So we, they moved. Okay. For, for clarification here, Sandy. Prior to this, for them being in Holt, they was in Holt. We had no North Point High School. So when it was redistrict, which as I said, the boundaries were not even drawn to after these documents were voted on. So when we when the district was, it affected, when North Point Prairie come on, it affected Holt and Timberland students, okay, because a new district was drawn. The board gave them the option to stay at their current school if they provide the transportation. Dr. Kane, may I ask a question, please? May I ask a question, please? Um, thank you, first of all, Director Schaefer, for, or sorry, Secretary Schaefer for the history. Can you speak to the in the intent or the spirit of this policy? Was it ever the spirit of the policy to um, accommodate families or, and or students if they actually moved, made a, a personal choice to move outside the existing boundaries under this language? And in addition to that, sorry, it's kind of a two-parter here. <laughs> and in addition to that, with all these motions, um, obviously I can't look up any kind of corresponding documents was were the boundary maps included the boundary lines with as they were drawn I would say that the boundary work was current conversation as well as um, the conversation that secretary Schaefer is speaking to I could answer the question but I think uh, John Schulte's actually taken point on this work literally since December the boundary and all the changes were ultimately adopted December 19th of 2019. So there's been work, there's been consistency, and there's been practice that's been deployed literally since then. And I, and I will defer to, to John to address the particulars. Um, but to briefly answer your question, I would say that a grandfather exception or clause, which we've had in the past in district, was not a part of the conversation uh, when it came to this particular high school's boundaries uh, and, and them opening up. Shelby. Thank you. So um, what Director or Secretary Schaefer shared um, was, was accurate. The motion as presented um, by, I think it was Secretary Buchanan at the meeting, um, included the uh, options for um, sophomores or fresh, current freshmen sophomores this year to have an option to um, remain at either Holt High School or Timberland or um, transition to North Point High School. All freshmen were going to go to the correct school, and then seniors would obviously stay at their location because we would not have a senior class at the new high school. Part of the conversation that took place at that board meeting that's not included in the motion um, was the, the task of creating a standalone process with a definite deadline on when we needed to have those student um, requests submitted and um, turned in so that we could process and then look at all the staffing. So um, the motion by Director, or Secretary Buchanan was approved and then um, after that we discussed what that process would, would look like and I shared that I would, and our office would develop a process that would have a defined deadline that we would um, seek out the input from the families and then make that determination. So on the survey that went out, that's why it had that date of September 25th. The intent and what was discussed at the meeting was that we would allow for students to move into the district and become established in their high school during the first quarter of school. And then by the end of the first quarter of school, we would have 
all of these requests in so we could get them processed, get them moved to the um, correct file set, and then start the planning for staffing and for scheduling. The other intent with the standalone process was that once that process concluded, we would then revert back to our standard residency um, requirements, which would include any other student that moved into the district after that date. They would um, be at Holt High School for this year with the understanding that next year they would transition to North Point and then any in-district families, just as if they were in Liberty's attendance area and they moved to Timberland, if they move and they change residential addresses, they would then attend that school. So that was the discussion that was had as part of that recommend, or that motion that was approved, and that's what our office put in, in place. And that's why we sent the survey out to the families that were identified to be at North Point's address because there was no change to Liberties. So the only um, students being affected by the boundary work would have been those students from Timberland and Holt High School. Um, our office has been working with families um, all year long and helping guide them and helping them through um, their processes whenever they're talking about moving or possibly relocating their family and what their options are and um, kind of what was mentioned earlier about being consistent with practice. We, we've had some difficult conversations with families and for the most part, the, the, the staffing and the planning for North Point and Holt and Timberland are in a good place, and we've been able to remain very consistent with, with what, what we've been sharing with, with families. But that consistency ha has included the fact that if you move, um, then that movement will cause you to need to attend the school associated with that new address, whether you're a current resident or you're moving into the district. And I will say too, I was at that meeting, the work session, I attended all of the meetings, and what Mr. Schulte is saying is exactly the way that I remember it as a parent sitting in the audience. My understanding was the choice was for people based on their residency at that time before the deadline to decide if they're going to remain at Holt or if they were going to go to um, North Point High School. If we were to honor it this way, couldn't theoretically be, we have a scenario where they started in the boundaries of North Point and, ch and chose Holt, for example, in this scenario, and then moved to Liberty, and we'd have to honor that by changing this? That's maybe a question. I, I believe Secretary that's the way the motion would read, yes. Thanks. No, I don't. I don't think so, no. This was an option that was given to the students at Holt and Timlin that was going to be affected by a move to North Point. It was based on their address at the time, not based on a future address if they moved and decided they wanted to stay at that high school. And, and that was never stated. That It, 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 was, it, it was never stated within, it may have been a discussion, it may have been the intent, but it was never part of the motion. I, I mean, think it's part at, of At one point, we, we offered the family stability. The issue is not about where they live. It has nothing to do with that. The issue is the student was given the option if they attended Holt they could stay if they provide their own transportation. There's nothing, there's nothing in here about intent or nothing about where they moved. But I think it's hard to capture every possible scenario or circumstance that, that we could come under. So as a board, we make a motion to speak to what we're, you know, the overarching theme, and then it's the job of the district administration to to enforce that well and that is as I had mentioned in here on the freshmen it so states on the freshmen their current residential address that says that because the freshmen didn't have a choice well that, that, that is true and the others would not have a choice if it said if their residency stays 
at a certain date, whatever the residency is, that's where they stay. So do we have a situation, or we're trying to get to why we're deciding something about this at all. So do we have a situation now where someone who was in either Holt or Timberland, they had the option of staying at their high school as opposed to going on to North Point, correct? And now do we have some, what is the situation on the ground? They do today? not have an option. Uh, Director Garber, what they've been, what they have been. There's people that have been denied. There's some in the process of being denied that I know of. They have not had the option. If they move, they've been told, no matter what, what the motion says, no matter what they filled out, if they move, they forfeited their option. But I think we've had students and, and I don't know if you can give us even the ballpark number over the last two years or families that have made the decision to move or not to move based on that motion and the and the process that was put in place around that that is negative I've got a question. It, because it has Sorry. With their decision to move or not move, they didn't have to make that. It, it affects these students none, none whatsoever because they they had declared their option. Based on their address at the time. Director Goodson, did you have a, a question? Yeah, this Comment. is a question for Dr. Schulte. Given that this decision was made back in 2019, I think there has clearly been communications on the instances which I think we're trying to describe around a student or a family that's made a choice based on the resident at the time they were sent that choice and have since moved. I'm assuming we've had the scenario where they have um, been denied that, chosen to stay because of recommendations and discussions. Speak to like what's happened over the last 18 months or so operating under this assumption, if that's what we want to call it, and those families' decisions that they've made because of those discussions. We have had numerous conversations with families um, going back to the, from the date that you know, the board approved the motion and, and, and provided direction. Families wanting to know what the process was going to be and how this was going to play out at work for their family dynamic. We certainly have had conversations with families where they have uh, pulled their homes off the market or decided that now is not the time because their, their kids have three years or five years left um, to make it through a certain feeder system. And so absolutely they have made decisions as, as parents on what, what they need to do. Uh, all things considered because of the direction that the Board of Education provided at the time, um, we have been able to be consistent with the families and they have been willing to work with us and as long as they have understood um, the guidelines for the most part um, they have been accepting of it we do have situations where people have have not been happy with the decisions that that have been made because it, it has not had a positive impact on their family dynamic and what they were trying to accomplish and that's a similar process that we go through with, with any movement related to boundaries um, and this hasn't been any different. What, what was nice about this is that we were able to stay consistent from the beginning and provide an equitable answer to all of our families and at the same time provide the opportunity for HR and teaching and learning to get the staffing and schedules in place so that we're ready to go in August. Thanks. Other questions, comments? Just make one comment, as Ms. Shield said, give him an actual answer and try to get everybody going. Uh, he gave him an answer of what is what the direction that we wanted him to go, not necessarily what had been approved by the board. It was by intent, not, not by what was approved. 
Thank you. Uh, uh, President Bates, uh, you do have a motion on the floor and a second. Director Garber, did you have any additional? So again, I'm kind of getting back to this. What's the situation at, that we're trying to, to really resolve at this time? Did someone who had chosen to stay at Holt, I mean, has someone moved and now they think they're going to be able to go to Holt still? Is that what the whole situation is? I'm a bit confused. Yes, it affects anybody, that people that's been denied, people that's in the process of being denied because they're changing residency. And the motion has does not deal with residency. It gives the family and the student the option for their sophomores and juniors, who will be sophomores and juniors, to stay at their current high school. And as Mr. Schulte said, some people had to make decision and what do we do? So did they, did, the, did people move to another uh, high school district? And now they still want to go back to Holt. No, they was Holt. Timberland. No, they want they was Holt students to start with. Well, that's what I'm saying. These are Holt students were to start with that that their that their address was in the their boundaries was in the North Point Prairie. So. Oh, I see what you're saying. So okay. when they when they moved, then they, I, I, if they move across the street. They can't stay at home if it's still in the North Point Prairie boundaries. So if they were in the district already, is what you're saying? Yeah. Okay. All right, Casey, can you read the motion that we have on the table again? Can I read? Can I read it back? Uh, uh, to to uphold the grade span as percentage. Previously, with no, which had no restrictions on residency. Okay. Yes. So uphold the grade span decision as it was approved. I said in 2019, just to be specific, without a residency restriction. Okay. And then can we have a roll call vote? Okay. Vice President Price. Aye. Director Abbott? Nay. Director Garber? Director Stoley? Nay. Secretary Shaper? Aye. Director Goodson? Nay. President Bates? Nay. Or may. Do we need a motion to keep as it stands, or are we good to? Okay. Any further discussion? All right. Before we adjourn, I just want to. Oh, really loud. I just want to take a second. And I think I can speak on behalf of myself and the board and administration. Just thank you to all our teachers, staff, parents, family, students. I know it's been a very unprecedented year, and thank you for sticking with us. Um, we're hopeful of how things are, they seem to be headed in the right direction. So just thank you for all of your patience and, and thank you for everything this year and hope everyone has a really great summer. Awesome. All right, with that, we need a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. All those opposed, motion carries.